Good morning. Oh, you look so summery and happy. That's so nice. Welcome to Good Shepherd. All of you online, welcome to you as well. We're so glad you're joining us today. Well, you are in for a treat. Pastor Glenn is going to be talking today about the subject of tea. No, no, don't laugh at that. Because, well, see, you don't know that Pastor Glenn has been a tea drinker for decades, decades. Even back in his Navy days, when he was a sailor, his shipmates would, on shore leave would say, come on, Glenn, let's go have some beers. He'd go, I'll go with you, but I'll have tea. He's <laughs> a very, very pure-hearted guy. We'll look forward to that. Some sad tidings to bring to you, and that is that our beloved sister, Carol Steinhauer, has passed so we ask that you remember her family. Uh, Charlie is her husband. John is her son. If you can remember that family in your prayers, that would be good. And speaking of prayer, as I say every week, it absolutely is my pleasure to say it again, that prayer is very important here at Good Shepherd. We take it very seriously. We pray for you throughout the week. If you have prayer requests, you can fill out one of those cards and give it to somebody here, and we will get that in. And then we will pray for you all through the week. Also, at our prayer station over here, we will pray for those that, uh, cards that come in. And if you have an individual prayer that you'd like to lift up with someone, someone will be there to pray with you. All right? Uh, finally, a word about communion. Communion we uh, serve every week, and it is Jesus' table. It is not Good Shepherd's table. It's not a Lutheran table. It's the Lord's table. So if you are a visitor here, please know that you're welcome. We're thrilled to have you. And if you want a gluten-free wafer, ask for it. If you want wine, that's the dark liquid. If you want grape juice, that's the light liquid. So uh, now, this is a nice thing. We're going to have an update from Don Johnson, who I'm going to call over, uh, who is uh, one of our leaders of our search team, and he's going to give you an update about that process. Good morning. So hopefully, as mentioned, my name is Don Johnson. I'm part of the senior call team, and we wanted to provide you with a few updates as where we are in the process. Uh, but first of all, I wanted to thank uh, a number of people for this, uh, the worship team, for giving us time to do this. I uh, wanted to thank the uh, prior call teams, the church staff, the church council for, as we've gone through this process, when we've needed advice, and uh, they've been there on the spot um, helping us with the advice that we need. Um, also wanted to thank you as a congregation for your prayers and support. Um, it's been very helpful and it's been present in each one of our meetings as we've, and we have been meeting regularly each week uh, since we were initially formed. Um, so, for the updates. Good, it's up there. <laughs> um, we have been diligent in forming. Um, we've been working on uh, unity and getting to know one another. Uh, the eight of us were scattered throughout the congregation or whatever, and frankly, uh, we didn't know each other that well. Um, but now we do, um, and we think our unity and, uh, will be a, a good strength as we go forward. Um, one of the things I wanted to let you know, excuse me, our, uh, the MSP, uh, which is the ministry site profile, has been approved. Um, this is our, basically this is a church resume um, that is now posted on the ELC a website nationally and is available for um, prospective pastors to look at and see. Um, we, it took a while to do. Um, I can say that, um, and the surveys that you participated in was a major part of all of that, and we appreciate your participation, and, uh, and thank you for that. Um, as we mentioned up there, we are, now that it is posted, it's been approved by the church council, it's been approved by the synod and posted, so we are now in a position that we can start re interviewing candidates. We haven't interviewed anybody yet, uh, but we're now just in the process that we can start. Um, with that, um, we're now also moving into the portion of where we're starting to cast nets. Um, and in that process, 
one of the things we wanted you to do is if you have recommendations or questions for the call team, we would ask you to direct those in email uh, to the address that's up there on the board, called to call at goodshepherd-naperville.org, um, okay? Um, last of all, um, we, the call teams do plan on providing um, updates every two weeks in the prayer and action guide. So we would ask that you uh, keep, keep on the outlook for those. And if you're not getting the prayer and action guide, please sign up for those and uh, so those can be emailed to you. With that, thank you very much. Let's show some love for Don and the entire team. How about that? That's, that's not an easy position to take and uh, to fill. And as he see, said, they meet once a week. So they're working hard for this church. And we appreciate that. Now, a lovely time of the service is when we stand, pass the peace, and remain standing for our opening hymn. Join me in our call to worship. Blessed is our God who comforts us in our affliction, that we may comfort others, for we are the church. If one suffers, we all suffer. If one rejoices, we all rejoice. So let us praise our God of love, for he is our strength and our song. You may be seated. Join me in our confession. Heavenly Father, forgive us for not always leading with love. Forgive us for so often taking everything we hear and everyone we encounter and perceiving them through a filter of distrust. Melt our hearts that we may pity no one but love everyone. Strengthen our resolve to be your agents of change in a hurting world. Most of all, God, let your love be our love. Amen. 
take a moment for silent reflection. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. May Almighty God strengthen you with the power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Without exception, God loves everyone. He is there for anyone who calls upon him. He forgives, teaches, and saves us through his precious Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's reading begins at the first verse of the 62nd chapter of Psalms. This beautiful song reassures us that God is our sanctuary and that he will provide for our necessary rest. Truly, my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Yes, my soul find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. The 11th chapter, the 25th verse. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Now, you don't know. Maybe some of you that have talked to me so far this morning know this is my first cup of coffee. Oh. It is the third sacrament. 
just saying. I don't know about tea. That's the title of today's message. I didn't drink any tea in the Navy, I assure you. On occasion, I have some tea, but coffee is my drink. And just for you, I was up at quarter to six this morning, and this is my first cup of coffee. It's teaching me something about maybe how close to coffee I am and how much of it I need, but it is good, I assure you. Okay, enough. I better not put it on the altar. That's probably not a good <laughs> Oh, I feel better now. We're in a series called Practicing the Ordinary based on this book, Liturgy of the Ordinary. And we've talked about all kinds of things, being in traffic and waking up and what happens throughout the different moments of our day, losing our keys, and today the title is Drinking Your Tea. But slowing down for those moments, being present in those moments of beauty, of God's creation. So this week, I came back from vacation last night. I was up in northern Michigan, this wonderful place. What's that island up there? Mackinac, yes. I was way north in Michigan with all my kids and all nine of my grandkids staying in the same large Airbnb. I don't know if it was large enough, <laughs> but it was really good. And we just had one of those family weeks where you catch up and you talk and you fight a little bit and everybody shares the load. And we did a bunch of things. We went to Petoskey Beach way up north on Lake Michigan and we did some river rafting and we did some kayaking and we did some hiking and some biking. And what I noticed is you had to organize it for the adults. But the nine kids, no one had to say, ready kids, go play now. Nobody had to tell them to go outside and climb trees. Nobody had to tell them to jump on their bikes. Nobody had to tell them to get on their skateboards. Nobody had to tell them to go run through the forest picking up mushrooms and saying, hey, Pa, what's this? Nobody had to tell the kids to play. But the adults needed a little bit of a schedule and a little bit of a nudge. What's that about? And that's why we're talking about Drinking tea, or coffee, or lemonade, or a glass of ice cold water, or whatever it is in the moment, and learning to enjoy life. Life. So one day last week, I was on the porch enjoying my coffee, and I was listening to the chitter chatter of my grandchildren, all nine of them running around, and I heard them saying, we're gonna play burrito tag. I thought, burrito tag? I missed out on that in my growing up years. What's burrito tag? And I'm watching them, and I, I still don't know exactly what it is. They're running around trees, and then they're hiding, and two people would hide, and one would not, and then they would pick up leaves and throw it at each other, and then someone would yell burrito, and then something else would happen that I didn't understand, and then they would run again. And they managed to play burrito tag for about 45 minutes. And I still didn't understand it, so I said to my little eight-year-old grandson, Ethan, Ethan, come here, come here, come, come here, Pa. Pa, I'm playing, just, just for two seconds, come here. I said, what is burrito tag? He starts to explain to me, he goes, you wouldn't understand. <laughs> Why wouldn't I understand? Why did he know that no matter how he explained, the game they had just made up an hour ago, I wouldn't understand. Maybe it's because I'm an adult. But what is it? You don't have to tell kids to play. You don't have to tell kids to find a stick and enjoy the moment. And we can say, well, that's silly. You've got to get on with life. Right. And then one day, you wake up and you're too what? Too adult to understand burrito tag. And all the other things about life that make it lovely and wonderful 
and beautiful. There's a spiritual writer by the name of Simone Veal. She said, there are only two things that pierce the human heart, beauty and affliction. Only two things grab our hearts and hold on to them, beauty and affliction. And if we lose what Jesus said in that gospel that I read about children being the ones that God revealed it to, if we lose that sense of wonder and play, then all we've got left is affliction. Trust me, life will bring you affliction. Can I get an amen? amen. That was strong on this side, a little weak on this side. You don't have enough affliction. And it turns out our brains are hardwired for the affliction part. When there's affliction, we go into hyperdrive to fix it, to find comfort, to find a solution. And that's okay, but it takes extra work to pursue beauty, to pursue a moment where I'm not stuck in worries and regrets about the past, or worries about the future. That's called anxiety. It takes work to be here, now, enjoying the beauty. We are in a place that's a sanctuary, which comes from a word which means a place in which you can Sit, and nothing can distract you, and you can experience the presence of something that's other than you, the holy, a sanctuary. And over centuries, it's also become known as a place where you can find safety. Well, it turns out we know from Scripture that you can find that sanctuary anywhere. Where is there a place in your life where God is not present? Is God not part of your coffee hour? Is God not part of washing the dishes and driving the car and all and playing burrito tag? Is God not part of that? And that's what this whole series is about. Somebody said to me a couple weeks ago, are we almost done with that series? I said, no, I think we're going to extend it another 20 weeks just because of you. <laughs> Only two things pierce the human heart, beauty and affliction. Let's look at what Paul had to say about beauty. Writing from a prison cell, think about that. Writing from a prison cell, he writes a letter to the church at Philippi to remind them this. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is beautiful. If there is anything beauty or excellent, if there is anything worthy of praise, then think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice those things and the God of peace will be with you. Paul says that the thing that I'm talking about right now, the pursuit of of beauty for beauty's sake is the pathway in and the key to peace. So if you've lived any time on this planet and you have experienced your share of affliction, then the pathway to peace is to pursue what Paul says, to find those things that are good, pure, lovely, right, true, beautiful. And when he says pursue them, that's an action word. That means it's going to take some effort on our part. Whatever is good, think on these things. So let me just stop right now. What sight have you seen in your life that you would say, that's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen? Now let's not be Lutheran. Share it with the person next to you. Go ahead. What's one thing you've seen that's really beautiful?
Is it a sunset, a sunrise? Is it the face of a loved one? Is it a painting? Is it, well, I don't know what it is for you. And probably me asking that question, hopefully some of you are saying, I can't give you just one. Good. Here's an assignment for the rest of the day. Spend some time with somebody that you care about and tell them about what else is on the list. Or do you have things to do? Got to wash the dishes. Got to fill up the car. Got to cut the grass. Good, get it done. And then sit and think about these things. Paul said it. I'm just telling you what Paul said. What sound, when you hear it, brings you a joy, a peace, makes you want to dance, makes you want to sing? What sound? I like rock and roll. This weekend, we or this week, we played some rock and roll. We had battling playlists. <laughs> because I got to show my grandkids what real music is, not that manufactured nonsense 90s pop stuff. But I mean Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin and things like that. Yes, I gave them some worship songs. Stairway to Heaven is a worship song, trust me. <laughs> but when I started playing some Motown, they were moving because they couldn't sit still. Is sound not a gift of God? And when I went walking through the forest and I was playing burrito tag with my grandkids because I figured out the key. Just make up the rules as you go along. <laughs> and that was the key. And somehow I was in. And I said, okay, everybody stop. And all of a sudden, you could hear the chirping and the crackling and the moving and, and all the things that a forest does. And they were, wow, sound, the gift of a good God. What smell just makes you close your eyes and get in the moment and enjoy the smell? I'll show you. Look, it's still steaming. And I got a mug from Bigsby Coffee. Anybody been to Bigsby Coffee in Michigan? Oh, it's so better than Starbucks. <laughs> Not quite as good as Cornerstone Cafe, but almost. Because I want to pick up that mug when I have my coffee, and I will remember burrito tag. And I will remember when I was hanging out with my grandkids. Because I need those lovely moments to pierce the moments of affliction that happen on a daily basis as soon as I turn on that box with the noisemakers telling me how bad it is and selling me outrage. All of them. What taste brings you back to a special place? Taste and smell are activators of memory. Do you think it's any accident that our brain takes taste and smell and connects it to a memory? Maybe that's a gift of a good God who wants us to be able to recall those wonderful things. So my wife made chocolate chip cookies. Anybody in here ever have a chocolate chip cookie? <laughs> Not just one, somebody said. Honesty in a Lutheran church is really close to God. Not just one. But chocolate chip cookies in the kitchen when you're smelling the smells and I can close my eyes and I can see my grandma. And it's on her right hand. She had these three fingers cut off in an accident working in a factory in Hungary and she had these two and she would take that wooden cooking spoon and she would mix that mix and she would make cookies till your heart was full, till your senses were full, till your stomach was full 
And that's a lovely memory for me. And I can go there any time I want to. Touch. What touch have you experienced recently that you thought, that's interesting. Take your clothes right now and touch them. Are there different kinds of textures? Is there a different texture on the pew in front of you? And some of you are like, now can you get on to the good stuff, to the deep theological stuff? But that is deep. Those are pathways into the deep. How many of you can worship God without sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch? Because if you don't have those, you're not here. Jesus came in a body. The scripture says that he died, rose again, and ascended to heaven and sitteth at the right hand of the Father. There's one person in heaven right now standing right next to God, and he's in a body because bodies matter. That means that sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch are holy things. And all these good gifts are ways of getting into those innermost place, places in our subconscious, in our soul, where we connect memory and holiness and all things good and true and pure. And it cultivates a sense of goodness in you. And then that goodness expands and you start to become a good person. A person who is Christ-like. And isn't that part of the point? So apparently, these things that I'm slowing down to talk about are deep spiritual disciplines. The discipline of laughter, of wonder, of play, of curiosity. Beauty for its own sake. Because once you leave the doors of this sanctuary, you will be told that beauty is nice when you can get it on vacation. But the rest of the year, you better grind it out. And things in your life must fit a pragmatic filter. They must work. They must be useful. What use is the Grand Canyon? What does it do for you? Maybe we should turn it into condo. Exactly my point. There's something deeply theological about beauty. Beauty for its own sake. Whatever happened to conserving things is part of what it meant to be a conservative. See, beauty crashes into all the categories that we think are important. And that comes from what? It comes from something deeply theological. The scripture says, and he made us in his image. It doesn't say that about the giraffes and the sharks and the puppies and the eagles. As wonderful, as wonderful as the natural world is, it is a reflection of God's glory. But we are created in God's image. Does God like beauty. Does God like beauty? Many years ago, I was, got to tell a dive story. I was on a dive trip, and I was diving in the blue hole down in the Caribbean. There are several of them. It looks like God took a big drill and went and drilled a hole in the seafloor about 1,500 feet deep. And it's about a half a mile across. And it starts in about 25 feet of water. So the top of the hole is in 25 feet. The bottom's way down there, 1,500 feet. And the interesting thing is you can go down and there's different kinds of coral that grow at 30 feet and 40 feet and 60 feet. Black coral, which is very rare, and you can find it. And the reefs are protected there because they're down inside this hole. Hurricanes can't get to them. And so they tend to grow, and there's fish like crazy, literally swimming through these coral things that are hanging out from the walls of the hole and swimming through the fish, and I had to push the fish aside. Come on, I want to see the coral. Get out of the way, angel fish. And then I turn, and out in the middle of the hole, I can see these dark shapes, eagle rays, and a shark or two. 
and a couple of barracuda, and they could care less that I was there. That's their hole. And they know I'm just a visitor. And so they're passing by, and all of a sudden I thought, why would God, in God's infinite creator wisdom, make all this beauty that no other human beings would see? And I realized the arrogance of my statement. Why shouldn't God make beauty that only God sees? Maybe God likes to hang some things on his living room wall, too like a coral reef or two. Maybe God created it just because he said, this would be cool. (sighs) And maybe I was the one who was missing the point. And so there I hung at about 70 feet, my mask filling up with tears of joy as I realized creation is God's canvas. And he is the artist with the paintbrush. And there's this tiny little dot called me. (laughs) And I'm privileged to be part of it. I'm privileged to play burrito tag. I'm privileged to jump out of a boat and go dive with fish like I love to do. I'm privileged to have a cup of coffee. I'm privileged to have sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. These are incredible things, friends. Let me read to you what the author says about this, of this book. And if you haven't gotten the book, it's still not too late. I highly encourage it. Our culture's relationship with pleasure is complex. On one hand, we seem obsessed with pleasure. We overindulge and overeat. We are addicted to amusement and are overwhelmed by pornography, sexual gratuity, violence, both on screens and off. Ironically, greed and consumerism dull our delight. The more we indulge, the less pleasure we find. We are hedonistic cynics and gluttonous stoics. In our consumerist society, we spend endless energy and money seeking pleasure, but we never seem satisfied. So maybe there's something deep here, deeply (laughs) theological. Pragmatism, another powerful cultural force, can denigrate our desire for beauty and enjoyment. We don't build parking decks for their aesthetic appeal. We just need somewhere to put our cars. The church has a reputation for anti-pleasure. Why is that? Why did we get known for people who don't like pleasure? Many theorize Christians, or generalize Christians in a general way that H.L. Mencken described as Puritans, people with a haunting fear that someone somewhere might be happy. My grandson telling me I can't explain the game to you. Someone somewhere might be happy. How did that happen? In reality, the church has led the way in the art of enjoyment and pleasure. New Testament scholar Ben Witherington points out that it was the church, not Starbucks, that created coffee. See how theological I am? (laughs) The church created coffee culture. Coffee was first invented by Ethiopian monks. The term cappuccino refers to the shade of brown used for the habits of the cappuccino monks of Italy. Coffee is born of extravagance an extravagant God who formed an extravagant people, who formed a craft out of the pleasures of roasted beans and frothed milk. Well, I could go on, but I won't. Because that's the point. How will you today experience something that you see as beautiful, that you hear as lovely, that you taste as good, that you touch and say, that's nice. How how will you experience the beauty of a holy God who said at the end of his creation work, it's good? Nope. It's, let's do that one more time. It's good, no, it's, let's pray. Lord God Almighty, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. 
I hope that I've kept it simple enough to invite people in to explore. Lord, you are good. You are the creator. Your word says whatever things are, are good, are pure, are lovely, are righteous, are beautiful. Think on these things. Teach us, Lord, to pursue beauty for its own sake because it will surely lead us to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand and affirm your faith with these ancient words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived of the birth of the birth Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. And at the right hand of the Father, he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to be seated. I'll invite our ushers to come and serve you by collecting offering as we watch this key video. My name is Douglas Sapkowski and I've been a member for the past 17 years at Good Shepherd. Work camp is a week-long mission trip typically for high school students. The work camp this year went to Port Huron, which is practically Canada. Uh, 
each day we go out and serve the community. We're assigned a specific project site. The projects are primarily is painting is kind of one of the biggest projects. There are like wheelchair ramps that get built, um, porches, railings. Originally I wasn't supposed to go when the sign up was happening, they had enough adult leaders, but then um, about mid-April, so about two week, two months before work camp, LJ texted me saying that the one adult leader couldn't go, the one guy leader. She's like, we need another one. Are you able to go? I'm like, hold on. So then I just checked my work schedule, making sure, and then within five minutes, I'm like, yep, I can go. <laughs> and then I put my PTO in. I was, as far as kind of involvement, just one of the guy adult leaders, and then also had my five individual guys that were part of my family group that, you know, just when making sure checking in throughout the week with them, um, doing the, the nightly devotions with them. I like the format that we have at work camp, breaking down into kind of the smaller family groups because you are able to, it's the same group of guys each night that we connect with. Um, just really diving deeper into kind of what the theme was for that night. So throughout the week, um, they have these things called care cards. They're supposed to be kind of just encouraging words. So they're all collected and then we receive them at the end of the week once we get back here. And then kind of when you get home, you kind of go through them all and read them. What really touched me was actually the one um, individual from my crew. This was, I think, his fifth work camp. And he kind of was like my right hand man. Just in the care card, he basically wrote that I was like a father figure to him. And that, I mean, just really hit home. I was in shock, like, you know, I knew we kind of had fun connection, but like just had reading those words and saying like, you know, that I basically like was mentoring and like a father did that week, um, almost brought me to tears. I mean, I reached out to him right away um, and just, you know, the thanks, you know, definitely stay connected. I would say, I mean, I've always felt like it was important to serve and, you know, be there for the students, I think is one of the main um, reasons why um, I've served. I think my main point and to kind of message to individuals is get involved. Even if it's a once a week, once a month, like any involvement I think of serving your time um, is just important just for yourself. It, you know, you don't want to serve just because it makes you feel good, but I mean, it does. I think it makes you feel good. It makes other feels good. Um, but I think just serving is just a big part of our religion and faith that um, I think the more that you do it, the, you know, the more comfortable you get and um, the more you want to do it. pray. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, time, and our treasures. Signs of your gracious love, receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Join me in a time of prayer. Lord God, you are beautiful, your word says. We come into the sanctuary to observe, to sit in, to enjoy your beauty, your timelessness, your eternity, your presence, your joy at your creation, your love for us, your graciousness in providing salvation, 
Lord, we also experience your beauty as we come to you with our requests and you hear them with grace. Lord, we have several this morning prayers for Jan Lepore who shattered both wrists. Lord, we pray for her that there would be healing. Lord, we pray for peace and comfort for those mourning for Carol Steinhauer, for her family, for her friends. We pray for peace in the Steinhauer family. Lord, we also pray for Cooper, Regis, and his family. Cooper was shot in the Highland Park shooting, along with uh, his brother and mother-in-law. Lord, we pray for them and for their families. We pray for uh, serious injuries. We pray for healing. Lord, we pray for healing in our land around the issue of violence. The human heart will be pierced by two things, beauty and affliction, and there is so much affliction that somehow could be avoided. Lord, we pray for conversations around things like guns. Lord, we pray for people who work in the mental health field. We pray for people who work in hospitals and frontline caregivers. We pray for police and fire and first responders. Lord, we also pray for the men and women who serve us in our military. We pray for their safety and care because there are too many who would want to perpetrate affliction on others. We thank you for those in our lives that provide peace, that provide stability. Lord, we pray for Naval Flight School, class of 2207, keep them strong and motivated. Lord, we pray for all those unspoken requests that we walk into the sanctuary with and perhaps didn't even know we had until this moment. Lord, you are a good God. You give us beauty to remind us that you are good and true and pure and holy and lovely. We thank you for that this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Jesus was betrayed, he gave us a great gift. The bread that he broke and said, take and eat, this is for you. The cup which he blessed and said, this is for you. But sometimes in worship we use this to look back and that is appropriate. We should look inward now and remember that this is for us to redeem us, to cleanse us. But it also is a future pointer. It points us to a place that Revelation says will be like a great big wedding feast. How many of you have ever been to a great wedding party? You have seen nothing yet. Jesus gives us the table to remind us that he is there in our past to forgive. He is there in our present to comfort. He is there in our future to give hope. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Give us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. I invite you to stand for the benediction. Where are you going to go today to experience the beauty of God in your life? Monday will come. Where are you going to go? What are you going to do to pursue God's loveliness? Hear this benediction. May the Lord God Almighty, the Lord of burrito tag, may the Lord of a good cup of coffee in the morning or tea if you prefer, may the Lord of all the beautiful things from the Grand Canyon to the grace of his Son bless you this day in every single beautiful moment of your life so you can be a reflection of his glory in a world that needs it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing. Brothers and sisters in Christ, go in peace to love and serve the Lord.